Uh, let's uh, welcome Mr. Jonathan Davis to kick uh, off our uh, <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jonathan Davis, the uh, president of the Semiconductor Business Unit for SEMI, and it's a really a great pleasure to be here uh, today to join the, uh, the CASP organization. Uh, CASP is just a wonderful group. Uh, I, I really commend this organization. SEMI and CASP have a, uh, a long relationship uh, and participate uh, on uh, many uh, events together. And uh, uh, Dr. Chen, I'd like to say congratulations on your, your 20 years. That's, that's a, a great milestone. Um, I think you're, you're doing better than a lot of the startups in the Valley, so. Uh, <laughs> do, do you have plans for IPO? <laughs> Maybe not. But uh, anyway, it, it is a great honor to be here. It's, it's uh, particularly an honor to be uh, presenting along with some of the, the great technology leaders from, from Intel and HP and ARM and Kilopass and um, uh, here on the agenda today. So I think, uh, well, those folks will talk a little more specifically about some of the uh, embedded technologies as well as the uh, interesting uh, software and multimedia applications. I'll talk to you on a little more uh, general level about some of the, uh, and non-technical level, about some of the market trends. <clears throat> and uh, from my perspective, the, the semi-organization is primarily uh, involved with the manufacturing segment, uh, the sector of the, uh, the semiconductor supply chain. So um, I'll say a few words about SEMI, then talk about some of the uh, uh, market data that uh, uh, supports our view of the uh, outlook for the industry. Um, so um, SEMI is a global industry association. We've been around for almost 40 years. Um, but uh, actually at this point about uh, 1,800 member companies worldwide that participate in the semiconductor manufacturing value chain. Semi started 40 years ago primarily in the IC manufacturing space, but as our member companies have applied their technologies to the uh, adjacent industries like PV solar or high brightness LEDs uh, or MEMS or uh, other areas, um, SEMI has also oriented activities in those areas. And so uh, uh, last year we actually set up distinct business units or, or segment divisions to address those various areas and I, I'm in charge of the semiconductor division. Um, our mission is to support our members' business interests um, to help our members' profitability. And we do that through a, a range of activities uh, you may be familiar with the Semicon expositions that are held worldwide in virtually every microelectronics manufacturing region of the world. Um, we also do executive conferences, symposia. The Semi International Standards Program is responsible for the development of over 800 manufacturing standards that um, you know really have made uh, efficiency in manufacturing and probably saved the industry billions of dollars and. Uh, efficiency by having standards. We have a market uh, research program, which is uh, the basis of much of the information I'll show in the next few minutes, um, as well as lobbying activity, public policy. I'll be going to Washington, D.C. In, in about a month to meet with uh, congressional officials to talk about uh, innovation policy, tax policy, and things like that. <coughs> and uh, there's more information on our website about our, our activity. Um, you know, the recent proliferation of pad and tablet technologies is a real good example of the integration uh, that's driving multiple silicon-related technologies. Um, it, it's a reason that our membership or, or our organization is diversified to address these different areas. It's also a, a real indication of optimism for the semiconductor industry. Um, and, and the iPad is, or, or any of the tablets, are really a, a great example of this, this culmination of not only of uh, semiconductor processors, but um, advances in display technology, MEMS and uh, accelerometers, um, 
and, and just uh, the many facets of silicon technology. And so uh, we're very optimistic about the future of the industry uh, as these great products are developed. Um, let me jump here and uh, start with a high level view and kind of work, work our way down through the industry to uh, talk about our view. Um, we have good reason for continuing optimism uh, in the semiconductor industry, not only by virtue of the, the products like the pads, uh, but also the economic trends. Uh, this chart shows the correlation between uh, the semiconductor industry, uh, which is shown in the blue line, and then the red line, which is worldwide uh, GDP. And for a long time, uh, the semiconductor industry trends were really influenced by IT investment cycles. And uh, more recently, with the diversification of the industry and the ascent of the consumer as a driver of semiconductor uh, consumption, there's been a much greater link between the uh, uh, global economic trends and the uh, annual fate of the semiconductor industry. Um, notwithstanding that, uh, in 2009, uh, in the worst global recession since World War II, the semiconductor industry only declined by 9%. Um, and uh, uh, it uh, quickly recovered as the uh, worldwide GDP grew about 4.2% last year. Uh, we saw a 32% increase in semiconductor sales. Um, the worldwide gross domestic product is about $57 trillion and grew on the order of 4% last year, uh, driven primarily by regions in Asia, which just the, uh, the Asian region aggregate was about a 7% uh, GDP growth. Uh, worldwide GDP for this year is expected to be 3.4% on the conservative side, and it may, may go uh, stronger from there. Uh, many economists think it could be stronger, depending on strength of the recovery of the United States. Um, and uh, on the other side, depending on what happens when the Middle East and, and uh, with oil could be the, the, uh, the negative side of the growth. But, but most indications are for uh, continued uh, worldwide economic growth. And this uh, supports our uh, view of a pretty optimistic upbeat time for the industry notwithstanding a uh, few challenges. Um, let's jump to electronic systems. Uh, so we're coming down a level from the economy. <clears throat> electronic systems grew uh, about 11% in 2010 and are expected to grow another 9% uh, in 2011. And that's, that's pretty good news given the long-term uh, growth rate average of about 6% for uh, electronic system sales. Uh, PC unit volume shipments actually increased in 2009. So in the worst recession uh, since World War II, PC unit, uh, units actually grew. Um, we're seeing computing systems doing very well at this time, maybe 18% unit volume growth in 2010. And, 12% in 11, so good double-digit growth. Cell phones are a very hot area. 13% um, unit growth in uh, 2010 and 9% unit growth projected for 2011. And, and the real story with cell phones is the shift to the smartphone. Um, in 2011, we're seeing about a quarter of phones shipped will be smartphones. And the smartphones have about 10 times the uh, IC content of a voice-only phone. Um, another interesting data point, in, in uh, 2010, uh, we passed the 5 billion subscriber level, uh, cell phone subscriber level. And that's, that's pretty amazing when you think about 7 billion people on the planet and 5 billion cell phone subscriptions. And, and contrast that with the fact that about 4.3 billion people wear shoes. Um, so there's actually more, more cell phone subscriptions than there are people that wear shoes on this planet. So that, that says something about the uh, pervasiveness of uh, this real silicon driver. Um, 
In the next few years, 80% of the cell phones sold will be sold to existing subscribers. So while we'll see maybe a diminishing in, at the rate of new adoption, the, um, the uh, shift to higher value silicon content uh, will keep with, with uh, feature-rich phones will, will keep those products um, driving uh, silicon sales as well. And analysts expect to see 1.5 billion units uh, shipped in, in uh, 2011. So consistent with the improved economic environment, the microelectronics industry also experienced a strong recovery from the downturn. The initial forecasts for last year, if you average the analyst forecasts at the beginning of last year, were calling for about 10% growth in the semiconductor industry. And in fact, it grew over 30%. It was a, it was a banner year for the industry on a new high. Um, about two, 298 billion, according to the Semiconductor uh, Industry Association, in a record year for both revenues and units. Uh, given the record year that uh, 2010 represents, it's helpful to drill down and look at uh, uh, unit and average selling price trends. The red line here reflects the downward pressure on ICs resulting uh, in pricing uh, at the low pre-2000 levels. However, pricing has stabilized in the last uh, uh, few months, or the last uh, five quarters actually. And this combined with record unit shipments has resulted in strong revenues last year. Um, some have speculated that due to the reluctance of chip makers to invest in new capacity in 2008 and 2009 um, has caused fab utilization to substantially increase in 2010, uh, giving chip makers a little added uh, pricing leverage. Um, here we look at a group of market research firms and analysts and their outlook for this year, and we see forecasts for semiconductor revenues in 2011 ranging from the 4.5% to 10% uh, range. And that, that you know, decline from the 30% was pretty, pretty much expected given the, the uh, unprecedented and robust growth last year. Uh, uh, a 10% growth is still very good for the semiconductor uh, industry. Um, in response to the recovery, semiconductor manufacturers increased their investment uh, to boost their production capacity. Uh, here we highlight installed fab capacity, uh, which is tracked by one of the semi-information products, which is called the Semi World uh, Fab Forecast Database. And following a decline in installed capacity, due to older fabs being decommissioned and 200 millimeter uh, memory fab shutting down, uh, the investments have resulted in a 7% uh, increase in capacity last year. Um, according to our World Fab Forecast Report, uh, just released spending on World Fab projects, including construction, facilities, and equipping, could grow by more than 20 2% uh, over last year's levels um, with fab equipment, including new equipment as well as used equipment, growing by 28%. Uh, the latest projection is based on analysis of our recently uh, announced increase in capital spending plans, mainly by foundries and many companies. Uh, total spending on fab projects could reach $47.2 billion this year uh, above the estimated 38.6 billion spent in 2010. Um, some companies will spend at record levels this year, reaching uh, all time historic levels. For example, TSMC increased CapEx from a record 5. billion in 2010 to another record of 7.8 billion in 2011. Intel's increased CapEx from 5.2 billion uh, last year to nine billion this year, and Global Foundries uh, is doubling its capex uh, this year, uh, up to five point four billion dollars uh, from two point seven last year. So most of the spending is directed towards upgrading existing facilities as companies try to avoid overcapacity and oversupply in building new uh, facilities. Um, some of last year's spending plays out into production capacity for 2011 and 12. 
um, we're estimating 9% and 7% growth in overall FAB capacity, uh, respectively, for 11 and 12. Uh, interestingly, also, China is expected to account for about 9% of total, total worldwide capacity, um, which is up from 1% uh, at the beginning of the decade in 2000. Not only is this uh, new capacity coming online, but the composition of fab capacity is changing. In 2000, logic dominated fab capacity, representing 41% of total fab capacity, followed by foundry at 24%, and memory at 21%. In the mid-2000s, uh, memory manufacturers invested heavily, especially during the peak of 2007, resulting in memory uh, capacity increasing to about 43% of the total by the end of the year. And while there's been an emphasis on gaining importance of the foundries uh, as a result of the IBMs transitioning to more of a fab light model, foundries are expected to account for about 28% of the worldwide manufacturing capacity uh, by 2012. And that, that's only 4% more um, compared to those uh, proportions in, in 2000. So memory still dominates with 40% of the capacity, uh, logic of 23%. Uh, percent. Uh, looking at fab capacity by manufacturer type, it should also come as no surprise that fewer companies represent an increasing uh, portion of the fab capacity. In 2000, the top five IDMs, or integrated device manufacturers, which were Samsung, Hynix, Intel, Texas Instrument, and Renesas, accounted for 29% of total fab capacity. By the end of 2012, the top five IDMs uh, will account uh, for 48% of total fab capacity. And of that, uh, Samsung is about 90%. And then on the foundry side, uh, over the same period, uh, TSMC, Charter, UMC accounted for 40% uh, of the total foundry capacity um, uh, in, in uh, 2000. And then 12 years later, um, we're seeing the, the major foundry companies now with, with uh, uh, Charter, Global Foundries, and AMD uh, merged together. Um, uh, the, the, uh, top three will account for 51% uh, of foundry capacity. So, um, this job won't spend a lot of time on this. This just shows the top spenders by year. Uh, you see uh, consistency in the, the top rank of Samsung, Intel, uh, Hynix, TSMC. I guess what's news here is SMIC from China has joined the ranks of the, the top spenders or expected to uh, this year and uh, will continue to be uh, a uh, spender for uh, fabs and equipment. This chart shows the number of fabs, the actual fab buildings, uh, that will be constructed um, for, uh, each year, this year and next. Uh, for this year, seven new projects were added and uh, most of those were uh, LED projects. So next year, uh, four new projects, new shells, uh, uh, have been committed, two are memory, one foundry, and one LED. This slide shows the breakdown of the capital spending by the spending type. I, I don't think I'll dwell on the num numbers here, but it, it delineates the sort of the shell construction from the equipping, and, and these numbers include both used and new equipment for the, uh, the total fab spending. Um, Uh, the previous slide showed that uh, slowdown in the new new construction projects, <clears throat> and this shows the capex broken down by uh, construction investments and equipment spending on fab equipment, uh, new and used, um, and that sh that shows the uh, number of new facilities by uh, region. <clears throat> So let's move to uh, <clears throat> semiconductor equipment as we work our way down uh, from the global economy through uh, 
electronic systems, semiconductors, and now looking at the equipment market after uh, contracting a, a half in 2009, a harrowing time for the equipment industry, we saw a very strong uh, rebound this past year, going 140%, a record unprecedented <coughs> level of growth in 2010, <coughs> excuse me, to reach over a $39 billion uh, market. Um, given the recent CAP CAPEX announcements, we expect growth of another 17% this year uh, and 3% in 2012. Sydney has several uh, data collection programs. We uh, collect different types of data. One of them is the North America Semiconductor Book to Build program. This is really the bellwether um, uh, reference for many in the industry, including financial analysts and, and industry analysts, to uh, understand trends in spending for equipment. And uh, you know what we see here. Uh, since the beginning of last year was the, the uh, uh, ramps and bookings and billings for new equipment from North American based companies to worldwide markets. And we also see um, that that level of spending is unsustainable and, and the industry needs to sort of pause and put some of that uh, new manufacturing equipment to use in FAB. And so you see the, the uh, pretty much the expected <laughs> slowdown um, in that, and then the corresponding uh, uh, decrease in the, in the book to bill. And this comes out on a monthly basis and is posted uh, on the SEMI website and seen throughout the, the news. Uh, another data point are, uh, is the silicon shipment index. Um, SEMI collects data from all the major silicon manufacturers and it shows the relative silicon shipment trends on a monthly basis. The data show the very strong uh, recovery from the bottom of the first quarter in 2009 through September of last year. And there again, we see some uh, seasonal uh, decline in silicon shipments uh, beginning in October of this year. And that's consistent with uh, the historical trends uh, where we typically see some of the slowing in the, the fourth uh, quarter. Um, Jumping back to equipment, uh, Sunny prepares two formal equipment forecasts a year, uh, one in December and, and one in July. However, given these uh, recent CapEx announcements, which really uh, changed the view of the year, we've prepared this updated uh, to the December forecast. This is actually the first time we're, we're showing this. Um, and. Uh, uh, note this is the new equipment for both front end and back end, which is a little different from the other data set. Um, and uh, here we see the very uh, strong growth of 140% uh, last year and the expectation for another 17% uh, growth uh, it, this year, at which point the industry will uh, <clears throat> level off maybe a couple percent growth in 2012. But by 2012, uh, the capital equipment industry will have exceeded its uh, prior peak and it will be an all-time uh, high for the industry. You can also see that uh, <coughs> Taiwan and Korea uh, really expanded over the past year. The, the growth rates will moderate quite a bit. Those are the sort of teal and the, the purple parts of the, uh, uh, the bar chart. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but you can see the, uh, the prominence of their spending. <clears throat> and uh, this is the same data, but instead of by region, it's looking at the uh, segment. Um, there have been some shifts in the market in 2011. Uh, spending on back-end equipment, test and assembly equipment increased about 170% in 2010. Um, some packaging, some contractors spent at record levels last year. <clears throat> and we don't expect that uh, robust spending uh, for at least the first half of this year. <clears throat> so that, that segment will decline uh, a bit this year. About $3.8 billion are spent on assembly and packaging equipment last year. And this surpasses the previous all-time peak of, of uh, $3.7 billion. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <clears throat> and 
and this chart illustrates the uh, annual silicon shipments by diameter. And we expect silicon shipments uh, to have increased uh, by almost 30% uh, for the year and, and increased in uh, all diameters. <coughs> Total shipments will uh, moderate quite a bit in uh, 2011 and 2012. Uh, to, to more traditional levels of uh, 6 to 7% growth rates. And then uh, sort of the last data set that SEMI uh, collects and, and uh, uses is the materials forecast. Uh, here we see the uh, semiconductor materials forecast to 2012 by manufacturing region. Uh, 2010 surpassed the previous high set in 2007 in terms of market revenues. Uh, we expect, uh, on average, 5% growth over the next couple of years um, in line with the, the uh, current projections for the overall semiconductor industry. Um, Japan, which has been the largest uh, materials consuming region, is expected to be uh, surpassed by Taiwan in the coming year. And uh, the rest of the world, primarily, primarily Southeast Asia, uh, represents uh, the third largest market for materials given the, uh, the demand for packaging materials uh, in those regions. <clears throat> and uh, I thought I'd put in a, a China slide given that this is a, uh, a China uh, Semiconductor Professional Association and that uh, we're, many of us are off to Semicon China for the, the big trade event in Shanghai uh, next week. Over the past seven years, uh, Semiconductor manufacturers in uh, uh, China have spent uh, thirty-six billion dollars on manufacturing equipment and materials, and uh, this year we're expecting uh, about four point two billion dollars of front-end equipment to be uh, uh, purchased by Chinese manufacturers, and then for the uh, test assembly and packaging, uh, another uh, four point seven billion dollars. So the new fat activity in China uh, uh, will probably be LED dominated. I'll throw in one last slide here just to uh, <clears throat> show that uh, another major trend for uh, many of the semi member companies is the growth of the LED market. And we talked about the three waves. Uh, the first wave was uh, LEDs used for uh, industrial uh, purposes. The second wave being uh, LED backlights for uh, laptops and mobile devices. The third wave now being the, uh, the uh, large market push by uh, uh, large uh, backlit LED TVs. And the coming wave will be the general illumination wave as many uh, countries around the world actually mandate a transition from old energy inefficient incandescent bulb to uh, the new uh, energy efficient LEDs. <clears throat> so we expect by uh, 2014 uh, to be a $20 billion worldwide LED uh, market and uh, a lot of that manufacturing will occur in China. That's where we see some of the new investment. So I think with the, uh, the one minute slide uh, flashing, I'll uh, uh, wrap up the presentation. Uh, these are just a few of the uh, upcoming semi-events. As I said, uh, uh, next week in, in Shanghai is the big semi-con China exposition. We've got standards meetings here at the uh, uh, semi-office in San Jose in March. We've got a large number of uh, technical uh, task force working on uh, manufacturing standards. There's the Advanced Semiconductor Manufacturing Conference, which will occur in the Albany area in May, and then uh, July 12th through the 14th is the big exposition, Semicon West in San Francisco. Uh, so if you will all join that. I have uh, some more slides to talk about our new uh, advanced manufacturing uh, and design segment for Semicon West, and we might come back and talk about those after uh, other speakers have a chance to speak. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and uh, look forward to hearing the other speakers now. Thank you.